Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a very interesting one. This is lesson no, only number three in the series, but it's proved to be very interesting already on life everlasting, on death, dying, and the future hope. And this lesson for October 15 of 2022 is entitled Understanding Human Nature. Now, where does that fit? Life everlasting, death, dying? Well, we know the people die, don't they? So I guess that's where it would fit. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we're coming to some very important and very consequential uh, ideas from Scripture and from the help of your friend Ellen White. Help us to comprehend all that they imply is our prayer in Jesus' name. Yep. Amen. Look at this introduction to our Bible study guide. Jim? The tensions between God's word, you shall die, Genesis 2, 16 and 17 of the new RSV, and Satan's counterfeit promise, you shall, excuse me, you sh certainly will not die, Genesis 3, 4 from the new American Standard Bible, was not restricted to the Garden of Eden. It was echoed throughout history. Many people try to harmonize the words of Satan and the words of God. For them, the warning, you shall die, refers only to the perishable physical body, while the promise, you certainly will not die, is an allusion to an immortal soul or spirit. But this approach doesn't work. For example, can contradictory words of God and of Satan be harmonized? Is there an immaterial soul or spirit that consciously survives physical death? There are many philosophical and even scientific attempts to answer these questions. But as Bible-based Christians, we must recognize that only the Almighty God, the one who created us, knows us perfectly. See Psalms 139. Thus, only in his word do, to us, that, that is the scriptures, can we find answers to th these crucial questions if from the Bible study guide for the Sabbath afternoon, October 8. Okay, here's a cra crazy question to start with. Why do you think Satan began his first conversation, at least the part that we have recorded, with human beings by claiming that God had lied to them? That seemed like, oh, hi, how are you? God lied to you, huh? <laughs> well, they could believe everything that had been given to them before. <clears throat> yes. And this is something that's different. Mm -hmm. Well, this is something claiming that it's true, but it isn't. So they had to use a different form of analysis, of judgment to analyze it. Okay, so what is actually the nature of humanity? What does our body, soul, and spirit consist of? And what happened at creation? And what happens at death? Yes. Back to that uh, Genesis 3, 4, you know, that says, The serpent said to, them, to the woman, You shall not surely die. Now, he didn't say, God's lying to you. He said, you're not going to lie. Well, that immediately puts a question uh, going on in, in Eve's head, and yeah. she doesn't want to come across like a fool. Mm -hmm. So, well, and then he goes on, and, and it, it, that was, that was a, a process of deception that yeah. was, was quite masterful, obviously. The yeah. results show that to be the case. But he's still doing pretty well in our day. Yeah, that's the point. It, it, and nobody's gotten over it. Mm -hmm. So, what is the nature of human humanity? Body, soul, and spirit. Carrie? And what happened at creation and what happens at death? Genesis 1, 24 through 27. Then God commanded, let the earth produce all kinds of animal life, domestic and wild, large and small, and it was done. So God made them all and he was pleased with what he saw. Then God said, and now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all animals, domestic and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself 
He created them male and female. That's a quote from American Bible Society. Holy Bible, a new Good News translation. Okay, then jumping over to Genesis 2, 7 and 19. Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils and the man began to live. So he took some soil from the ground and formed all the animals and all the birds. Then he brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and that is how they all got their names. That's from the Good News Bible. Now it seems like a strange thing to do, um, doesn't it? I mean, you create a man and then you say, oh, here, start naming these things. I don't think it's just, you know, you're a cat, you're a dog, you're a lion, you're a giraffe. Okay. I think Adam was analyzing these, comparing them, doing a scientific study on them. Mm-hmm. Much more than just naming. Okay. That's a, so, that's a euphemism. Yeah. This is a, this is a intelligent being that's making, that's analyzing what he's seeing, huh? Okay, well, Gordon, can you give us a rest there? From the Bible study guide, although both animals and man alike were made from, quote, the ground, end quote, the formation of the man was distinct from that of the animals in two main ways. First, God shaped the man physically and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being, Genesis 2, 7. He was a physical entity before he became a living one. Second, God created humanity as both male and female in the very image and likeness of the Godhead. <clears throat> Genesis 2, 7 explains that the infusion of the, quote, breath of life, end quote, into the physical body of Adam transformed him into, quote, a living being. And there's a Hebrew word there for it. Nefesh or, or literally a living soul. It means that each of us does not have a soul that can exist apart from the body. Rather, each of us is a living being or a living soul. The claim that this, quote, soul, end quote, is a conscious entity that can exist separate from the human body is a pagan, not biblical idea. Understanding the true nature of humanity prevents us from accepting the popular notion of an immortal soul. No, of an immaterial in, soul, mm -hmm. and all the dangerous errors built upon that belief. Okay, what do we mean by an immaterial soul? It's not made of something atoms. you can touch. It's, yeah, it's it's yeah. ethereal. It's a see image. the ancient Greeks, and we mentioned them briefly, but we're going to talk about some more. Talk some more about them. The ancient Greeks basically said, if you can touch it, it's evil. If you can't touch it, it's good. So this is the immaterial. It's good. Continuing from the Bible study guide, in fact, not only is the very nature of life a mystery, open parentheses, scientists still can't agree on exactly what it means for something to be alive, but even more mysterious is the nature of consciousness. How does the few pounds of material tissue, that is cells and chemicals, in our heads, the brains hold and create immaterial things such as thoughts and emotions. Those who study this idea admit that we really don't know from the Bible Study good Guide for Sunday. Okay, Gordon, we chose you to read that paragraph so you can explain us to us. You're a neurologist, you're gonna explain this to us, aren't you? Absolutely, this is, <laughs> this is where my, my, my children, my daughter, my youngest, when she was in about fifth grade, came to me and said, Dad, Tell me what the brain does. Okay. And I thought, this is my opening. This is what <laughs> I've been looking for. Okay. <laughs> and so I started to explain it, and you know, she wanted to know about the senses and the brain. And after about two minutes, she says, Dad, that's more than I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> it was more than two minutes. <laughs> well, but she was saying it after two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I think I went on a little bit longer than that, you know. But God has promised us not only life on this planet, but also the possibility of eternal life as well. So what does the Bible actually say about the nature of the soul? Ezekiel 18, 4 and 20. 
The life of every person belongs to me, the life of a parent as well as the, that of the child. The person or soul, or soul who sins is the one who will die. It is the one who sins who will die. This is from verse 20. The son is not to suffer because of his father's sins, nor the father because of the sins of his son. A good person will be rewarded for doing good, and an evil person will suffer the evil he does. From the Good News Bible. And in the original Hebrew, all those person and fa things, those are the words soul. The soul that sins will die. That's what it says in the King James Version. Well, Romans 6, 23 tells us clearly that sin pays its wage, death. And Romans 5, 12 refer, reaffirms that because sin has spread, death has spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. Okay, I'm going to ask a question here. Sure. Where is the text that says unto the third and fourth generation? That's well, in the Ten Commandments. Well, that's part of the Ten Commandments, but it, it, what it says in the, in the Ten Commandments is talking about the results. That's in the Second Commandment, but then it promises they're also in, what, the Fourth Commandment. So, and, but there's lots of other places. Uh, this, in, in Ezekiel 18, that you just read a couple of verses from, is trying to explain that. Uh, so what is, in, what is the relationship between the life that exists in human beings and the life that exists in animals? Is there any diff real difference in the essential nature of humans and animals? Ecclesiastes uh, 3, 19 and 20. I'll answer first. It's okay. the brain. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the brain, the intellect, the ability to think and reason and make choices. So what's different between, what's the difference between human brain and, let's say, a porpoise's brain or an elephant's brain? A lot. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you want the two-minute version? Or the <laughs> <laughs> okay. Charles? Ecclesiastes 3, 19, 20. After all, the same fate awaits human beings and uh, animals alike. Now let and me interrupt for a second. We already said that man was created out of what? Dust. Well, soil, really. Soil. Yeah. And animals were created out of? They're spoken. And soil. Chemicals. The same thing. No, no. It says right there. We just read it a little while ago. Genesis animals were also made out of soil. Genesis chapter 1, though, talks about he spoke and... Well, that's Ezekiel. Well, I mean, not Ezekiel, that's uh, Psalm 33, 6 and 9. No, yes, but also in Gen... Uh, that's why, because I grew up yeah. uh, knowing that uh, it was only Adam that uh, was formed out of... Well, so I went to Genesis chapter 1, that's what I was reading a little while ago. Uh -huh. And he spoke and the birds came about mm -hmm. and the... Mm -hmm. It's, it it oh. says the same thing. It says the same thing about people in Genesis one, but it goes on to give more details in Genesis two. So, but it, it says right there. We we quoted it right out of the Bible. Okay. Um, one. Okay. Go ahead. One dies just like the other. They are both the same kind of creature. A human being is not better off than an animal because life has no meaning. For for either. They are both going to the same place, the dust. They both came from it. They will both go back to it, goodness Bible. Yeah. Some people say this is, that <coughs> all of Ecclesiastes is the speech of a depressed man. <laughs> yes, elderly man. Elderly depressed. The second concept is the physical death of a person implies the cessation of his or her existence as a living soul. Hebrews nefesh. Yeah, the, the word for soul in Hebrew is nefesh. In Genesis 2, 16, 17, God had warned Adam and Eve that if they should ever sin by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. We talked about that last week. That's in the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday, October 10. So yes. just to review again, Genesis 2, 16 and 17, he said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden 
except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat that fruit, the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Okay, so now it's time to deal with some other questions, some more challenging ones perhaps. Do animals have souls and spirits? That's, that's a tricky one, that one. If you work on some <laughs> of these big sheep and cattle stations, they've got dogs there that obviously do think. Oh, yeah. And they, I mean, you'll see them run across mobs of sheep on their backs just to head them off on a different direction. He, he knows. Yeah. There's a mix oh, yeah. there. Oh, yes. There's, there's animals that they're uh, birds in Africa that will pick up a stone and go over and bang it on a, a bird's uh, egg, break open the egg so they can eat the contents and yeah. so forth like that. Yeah. They think there's no question about that. Well, uh, the way they build their nests, like the weaver birds. Yeah. Oh, absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely meticulous. So. But does that mean they have a soul? Well, that's what Whatever I'm trying to You're supposed to help me with that. These verses tell us clearly that the soul who sins shall die. And but sin pays its way to death. How about, uh, how about a lion? This is for real. Mm -hmm. You see these pictures will pick up a little lamb or a baboon that it would not kill the, mm -hmm. the baby. Mm -hmm. You know, it would not. Maybe it ate the mother, who knows. But yeah. So, do they have compassion? Well, those statements apply to all sinners, which rules out the possibility that some part of man escapes the body and lives on. So, can an animal sin? You answered, uh, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was just thinking of our dog, Lucy. <laughs> I want to say, yeah, she sinned <laughs> more than once. Well, how often will they, animals, look at you and you, they want to do something, you know, you tell them not to, and? They'll do it. If you turn your back, Oh, well, you don't have to turn your back on no. Lucy. No, she'd <laughs> run through that electric fence, yelp, but she'd go anyway. Yeah. But after seeing the entire world was cursed, mm -hmm. and they got it too. Yeah. Well, God wants all of us to share His eternal life. That was, that's what God really would like. How do we know that? John 6, 40, For what my Father wants, this is Jesus Himself commenting about His Father, what my Father wants is that all who see the Son and believe in Him shall have eternal life and I will raise them to life on the last day. I mean, that's a pretty straightforward promise, right? Yeah. And we, as we have discussed before, there was no reason for Christ to come the first time if He does not plan to come back. Why do we say that? You know, what would be the point? Yeah. yeah. He came to teach us what's necessary for us to understand so that we can be saved when he comes the second time. So what's the point of coming the first time if he's not coming back? I want to go quickly go back to last week's. The Lord himself is saying, I will raise you up on the last day. And the whole Christian world and outside world is saying, no, the moment you die, you go straight to heaven yeah. or hell. So would there be any reason for a second coming if everyone who dies has already gone to their reward? Yeah. Now, some people claim that, well, it's the body that dies and the spirit of the soul goes off to heaven and when the resurrection comes, he picks up the body. Well, hold on. What's he going to do with the body? You've already got a new body, or, or you should have, right? It doesn't make any sense. Compare these statements in Genesis 2 and Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 7. Jim? Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils and the man began to live. Ecclesiastes 12 verses 1 to 7. So remember your Creator while you are young, or still young, before those dismal days and years come when you will say, I don't enjoy life. That is when the light of the sun 
the moon and the stars will grow dim for you, and the rain clouds will never pass away. Then your arms that have protected you will tremble and your legs now strong will grow weak. Your teeth will be too few to chew your food and your eyes too dim to see clearly. Wow. <laughs> your ears will be deaf to the noise of the street. You will be barely able to hear the mill as it grinds or music as it plays. But even the song of a bird will wake you from sleep. <laughs> You will be afraid of high places and walking will be dangerous. Your hair will turn white. You will hardly be able to drag yourself along and all desire will have gone. You are going to your final resting place and then there will be mountaining, morning. There will be morning in the streets. The silver chains will snap and the golden lamp will f fall, fall and break. The rope is the rope as the well, excuse me, At the, the rope well. as the well will at, break at the rope well. uh, with rope at the well will break and the water jar will be shattered our bodies will return to the dust of the earth and the breath of life will go back to god who gave it to us well that's a cheery yeah. yes <laughs> so but but look at those two contrasts clearly god starts out he takes soil he breathes into the loss into it his breath and man begins to live. At the end, as things deteriorate, deteriorate, and deteriorate, we lose the breath, and the body goes back to the dust. So like it's a refuse a recycling yeah, program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about this? At the time of the flood, we're told Genesis 7:22. Carry. Everything on earth that breathed died. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. What is the essence of, quote unquote, the spirit of a human being? Can it have a separate existence apart from the body? Okay, so do you do you have that's a big question. Yes. Do you have a spirit? Are you a spirit? So if you're not animated, you're dust. Okay. Well, what happened at creation though? He took the clay and they breathed into and it became a living, living soul. Mm -hmm. A living being. A living being. Yep. Okay, right. It existed. So, uh, the, so there are two components, the body and the breath. Without the breath you got... I think yeah. it says living soul somewhere. Yeah. Well, that's, 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 what, the, that's what the King James says. That's what yeah, the traditional... Like Indians, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good news says a living being. Yeah. Okay. But or man began to live. Yeah, man began to and live. And then when you allow the Lord's Spirit to come and rule over us, well, that's the Spirit God of God. That doesn't rule. Okay, here's the, here's the challenge. He doesn't rule. He gave you dominion for to make love, choice. For the love of God constraineth us. I'm King James. Edu educate. <laughs> educate. <laughs> All right, we'll continue later on. <laughs> okay. But there's a bit of a challenge. There's, there were limited, both Greek and especially Hebrew, ancient Hebrew had fairly limited vocabularies. And the same word could be translated wind or breath or spirit. All the same word. So did God breathe a wind into Adam? Did he breathe breath into Adam? Or did he breathe the spirit into Adam? And if so, what was it that went into Adam? The air. The air. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's how, I think whatever the word ru means the air. The he spirit. gave the spark Ruah. of life. Ruah, right. right. Yes. Ruah. God made the metabolic processes start. It wasn't just a clump of clay anymore. It was a, the, right. the enzymes were working, the membranes were working, the right. Everything How long that <laughs> I it's not even a fair question. How long did it take for God to plan all that? And did he just touch that clay and all of a sudden everything's working? Because he's boy. It just blows my mind to think about that process. Yeah, but he'd always had a, a creation millennia or perhaps sure. early with the others, so Yeah. It's, it's providing it, that they all work the same way we do. Yeah, assuming well, but, but, 
No. Well, I'll tell you, but if you go to uh, Psalms 82, 6 and 7, he's talking to these ones that we're talking about, and they're going to die like men. Yeah, if they... Oh. If they sin. What's that? If they sin. Yeah, well, if they have sin. He's talking to the, to, to the uh, Elohim that uh, there, in Psalms 82, uh, 1 through 8 or there, you can read about it. He says, you're gods, but you're going to die like the princes. You're going to die like men. What happens to the spirit if the body dies? Is there some spirit that escapes and goes back to God? The breath of life that God breathed into the nostrils of Adam and that he also gives to all other human beings returns to God. In other words, life simply stops flowing into and through them. The life-giving principle that keeps every cell in our bodies working ceases. The cells die. It is like unplugging an electric machine. When unplugged, it stops working. Like Does that mean that animals also have an immortal spirit that survives somewhere? Ecclesiastes 3, 19 and 20. After all, the same fate awaits human beings and animals alike. One dies just like the other. They are both the same kind of creature. A human being is no better off than an animal because life has no meaning for either. They are both going to the same place, the dust. They both came from it. They will both go back to it. Good News Bible. <clears throat> and Psalms 104, verse 29. When you turn away, they are afraid. When you take away your breath, they die and go back to the dust from which they came. Good News okay. Bible. Okay, so when you, speaking to God, when you, God, take away your breath, what do they do? They die. They die. Go back to the dust from which they came. God has a final answer to the sin and death. He will finally eliminate both sin and death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Myra? The last enemy to be defeated will be death. Good news, Bible. So what does the Bible say about the consciousness and activities of the dead? Psalms 115, 17. The Lord is not praised by the dead by any who go down to the land of silence. Well, and the footnote says the land of silence is the world of the dead. Yeah. Okay? Psalms 146, 4. When they die, they return to the dust. On that day, all the plans come to an end. Good news, Bible. Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 10. Yes. The living know that they are all going to die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. They are completely forgotten. Work hard at whatever you do because there will be no action, no thought, no knowledge, no wisdom in the world of the dead. And that is where you are going. There are many people who have, who have claimed and still claim that they can communicate with the dead. Is there some being who is talking that is talking to them or who is talking to them? And if so, who is that? Some of those angels that were with Satan around the Yes. How can you prove that? We go to um Witch of Endor, uh, Solwyn, mm -hmm. and supposedly got Samuel out of the grave. And Samuel even says, Why do you bother me? What's wrong? Why did you call me up? Why did you call me Now, that's a bit of a problem because yeah. we believe Samuel was a good man. Right. He should be where? In heaven, right? According to that theory, he should be in heaven. So he should have been called down. But she said, I will call him up. Hmm, something's wrong here. Okay. Well, if these biblical statements are correct, what does that tell us about the state of man and death? It should tell us that there is no everlasting burning hell or even temporary purgatory waiting for those who die unsaved. Furthermore, God has a wonderful future for those who accept his plan for their lives. That plan is everlasting life. Notice these words. According to Psalm 146, the mental activities of the individual cease with death. His spirit departs, 
he returns to the earth and on that very day his plans perish. That's from the New American Standard Bible. There's a perfect biblical depiction. Uh, this is a perfect biblical depiction of what happens at death. Ecclesiastes 9 adds that the dead know nothing, and in the grave there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom. Ecclesiastes 9 verses 5 and 10. These statements confirm the biblical teaching that the dead are unconscious. The biblical teaching of unconsciousness and death should not generate any panic in Christians. First of all, there is no everlasting burning hell or temporary purgatory waiting for those who die unsaved. Second, there is an amazing reward waiting for those who die in Christ, from our Bible study guide for Wednesday, October 12. So we have a comment from Ellen White. Jim? To the believer, death is but a small matter. Christ speaks of it as if it were of little moment. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death, he shall never taste of death. To the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. John chapter 8, 51 and 52, Colossians 3, 4. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 187. Excuse me, 787. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it should be clear that when a person dies, his thoughts perish. The next thought that a dead person will have will be at the point of resurrection. The righteous will be raised at the second coming and the wicked at the third coming. They will be completely unaware of anything that has happened between that, the moment of their death and the moment of their resurrection. The time will pass as if in the twinkling of a moment. So how can God recreate beings after they have been dead and make them just exactly as they were before? I, I think hope we're not made exactly as we were well, when we went to the grave. Yeah, we're not. Or, uh, or either that or we grow very quickly. I, the example I can give for those who are familiar with modern cell phones and so forth like that, you can go down to the store and you can say, I want to buy a new phone. And they say, okay. They pull out the cell phone and there's nothing on that phone at all except maybe a small operating system. Nothing on there at all. And they say, okay, did you have such and such a kind of phone before? Yes, I did. Okay, all that information is stored somewhere. You pick out the phone, they take you a minute or a few minutes, and you pick that phone up now and it remembers everything that was in your other phone. So if we can do that, I mean, God can do it way better than anything we can do. So God has that kind of a, not the physical body with all its aches and pains and, and death and diseases and cancers and heart attacks and strokes, et cetera, et cetera. God can take whatever our body is here. He's got, a, he's got that kind of picture of everything and he can put it into, and I think, I think of the old days, it's not so obvious these days because all the computers are so powerful that they all perform pretty well, but in the old days, when you had to, everything had to be on a little floppy disk and so forth like that, and you upgraded to a new computer, it's, whoa, what an improvement, you know? But it's, it, would, it was just an empty machine with nothing there until you put that memory in there, right? And fortunately, God can repair all the DNA defects and the mm -hmm. other defects in our DNA, but... Uh, yep. But it can't force you to think one way or the other. Yep. The he he, he will still. not. No, it's, our memories it's not his character. There. Our memories will be there. Our personalities will start that way, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that's something, the development of character, I guess that's what this life is. In other words, we choose yeah. to we like that way or, or reject the, and reject the other way of thinking. Well, the Bible uses some interesting expressions to describe what happens to people when they die. And notice these passages from the Old Testament. They had some very colorful ways of talking about that. I guess, whose is that now? Probably mine, is it? Carrie. Where well, was that? I was Genesis 25, 8. Okay, sorry about that. Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age an old man and satisfied with life. 
and he was gathered to his people. It's from New American Standard Bible. Okay. What does it mean, gathered to his people? To the grave with them. Okay. An actual fact, what they often did in those ancient times, a family would have a cave maybe, or a, a, something carved in a rock, or even a hole dug in the ground. A, and so, and when you died, you, your body would put there, and usually there was a little bench or a shelf or something like that, and your body would put there, be put there. And of course, there was no preservatives of any kind, and a fairly, fairly short period of time, everything but except the bones would be gone. I think. And, and when the next person dies in your family, they come in there and very carefully and gently gather up all your bones and put them in a little container, stick it over to the side, and then you get to place. So they say, okay, you're gathered to your... Sleep with your fathers. Your people. Sleep with the but, fathers. Yeah, and I think Cave of Machpelah was pretty popular. Mm -hmm. Several yeah. of these folk were yep. buried there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So 2 Samuel 7, 12, Kerry? When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will okay. raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. From the New American Standard Bible. Okay, there's gathered to your people, and now it's lie down with your fathers. Yeah. And now we understand how that happens, right? And David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Okay, same story, right? Yeah, and we go on. So Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah, his son, became king in his place. So this is not just talking about something that happens only to the righteous. This happens to everybody, right? Yes. Right. Okay. And from Deuteronomy 32:50, Then die on the mountain where you ascend, and be gathered to your people, as Aaron your brother died on Mount Hor, and was gathered to his people. Okay, gathered to your people. Now, was Moses gathered to his people? Uh, no. no. It was a special that circumstance. Was a special, deal. <laughs> special circumstances. That, how do we arrange for having those special circumstances? I want Elijah's. You want Elijah's version, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that would be nice, too. That could happen. Okay, what does the fact that both good and bad kings went to the same place at the de at death teach us about the nature of death. Uh, 2 Kings 24, 6, Gordon? So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers. And now Jehoiakim was a wicked king. And Jehoiakim, his son, became king in his place from New American Standard Bible. Then same from Good News, Jehoiakim died and his son Jehoiakim succeeded him as king. I just to see about the difference in the translations. Go ahead. And likewise, Second Chronicles 32, 33 from New American Standard. So Hezekiah slept with his fathers. Now Hezekiah was one of the good kings. Good kings, right. And they buried him in the upper sections of the tombs of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of J Jerusalem honored him at his death. And his son Manasseh became king in his place. That boy. Yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And then same from the good news. Hezekiah died and was buried in the upper section of the royal tombs. All the people of Judah and Jerusalem paid him great honor at his death. His son Manasseh succeeded him as king. Good News Bible. So you can see the colorful ways they, that it says literally, Hezekiah slept with his fathers. That's what it says literally in the Hebrew. But the modern translation says, no, he died. Would you spend uh, at least a little time on what you briefly mentioned uh, that uh, the spirit and breath and the air is exact same word in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Was it Hebrew and also Greek? We're, we're gonna, we're, I hope we're going to have time to get to that. We need to. I think that is very yeah. crucial. Okay. So whenever you do that. Yeah, we'll try to make sure. Yes, yeah. please do that. Okay. Another biblical way of describing death is by stating that someone rested with their forefathers. We've seen those verses. And King David's about King David's death, the Bible says that he rested with the fathers and was buried in the city of David. The same expression is used in reference to several other Hebrew kings, both faithful kings and unfaithful kings. And David slept with his fathers, we already saw that, and was buried in the city of David. So what can we conclude from these ideas? From the Bible study guide. 
we can identify at least three meaningful aspects of resting with the forebears. One is the idea that sooner or later, the time will come when we need to rest from our own tiring labors and sufferings. Another idea is that we are not the first and the only ones to follow this undesirable trail. Because our forefathers already have, done, have gone ahead of us, the third idea is that by being close to them, we are not alone. Being buried close to them. Be, being buried close to them. We are not alone, but remain together even during the unconsciousness of death. This might not make much sense to some modern individualist uh, cultures, but it is very meaningful in ancient times. Those who die in Christ can be buried close to their loved ones, but even so, there is no communication between them. They will remain unconscious, and unconscious until the day when they will be awakened from their deep sleep to rejoin the loved ones who died in Christ. Imagine what it'll be like if the dead were actually conscious and could see that life, what life was like down here, especially for their loved ones who often suffer terribly after their death. Why then should the truth that the dead sleep be so comforting to, to the, the living? living. Mm -hmm. From our Bible study guide for Thursday. What do we know about the future existence of the wicked? Revelation 27 through 15. After a thousand years are over, Satan will be let loose from the prison and he will go out to deceive the nations scattered over the whole world, that is Gog and Magog. Satan will bring them all together for battle. As many as the grains of the sand of the seashore, they spread out over the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people and the city that he loves. But fire came down from heaven and destroyed them. Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet has already been thrown, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Whoa, that's kind of scary. Who's being thrown there? Devil, the devil and his okay, Satan or the devil and the beast and the false prophet. Okay, we don't have time to go into those things in a lot of detail, but go ahead. Then I saw a great white throne, and the one who sat on sits on it. The earth, heaven fled from the presence of where, where sin no more. And I saw dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were open, and then another book was open, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Then the the sea gave up the dead, death and the whole world of the dead also gave up the dead they held, and all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and the world of the dead were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. Whoever did not have their names written in the book of the living were thrown into the lake of fire. Goodness Bible. That sounds like a pretty serious thing, doesn't it? If, if it were, oh, go ahead. If it were not the truth and soul of all men passed directly to heaven at the hour of, uh, of dissolution, that is when they die, okay, then we might well covet death rather than life. <laughs> Many have been led to the belief to put an end to their existence. When overwhelmed with trouble, perplexities and disappointment, it seems an easy thing to break the bitter, brittle thread of life and soar away into the bliss of the eternal world. This is Ellen White, Great Controversy. Yeah. Nowhere in the sacred scriptures is found the statement that the righteous go to their reward or the wicked to their punishment at death. The patriarchs and prophets have left no such assurance. Christ and his disciples have given no hint of it. 
The Bible clearly teaches that the dead do not go immediately to heaven. They are represented as sleeping until the resurrection. Ellen White, Great Controversy, 549, 550. So, why does the Bible say that the devil, the beast, and the false prophet will be tormented in the lake of fire forever and ever? What is the meaning of he shall serve him forever? Ezekiel 21, 6. Talks about... Exodus. I'm sorry, Exodus, thank you. Uh, talks about slaves who said, you know, I like working for this master, and the slave master says, okay, let's put, we'll make a hole in your ear here, and that'll be a sign that you're going to be my slave forever. Is that an earring? It doesn't talk about what they wear in the ear. It just says it's a hole in the ear. Okay, what is the meaning of... Uh, okay, the following note, abbreviated from the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament by Arndt Gingrich, may be helpful. Jim? To the ancient Near Eastern mind, the vast stretches of time that we try to envision as, quotes, forever, were unfathomable. <laughs> to them, the term forever just meant as long as it is supposed to last. The Greek lexicon describes this as, quotes, of time to come, which, if it has no end, is also known as eternity from the Arndt and Grin Ingrid. Okay, so if the slave is working for his master and he says, I want to continue working for you for the rest of my life, and the master says, okay, we'll make a hole in your ear and that proves that you belong to me, how long is the slave going to serve his master? Until he like, stops serving, until he Exodus, dies. Well, let's just look at this. Look at why Exodus 21.6. Then his master shall take him to the place of worship. There he is to make him stand against the door of the post, doorpost and pierce his ear. Then he will be his slave for life. But if you go back to, hold on here just a second. Um, we find one of the more traditional translations. That's not what I wanted. Looking for King James. Well. Then his master shall bring him to God. Then he shall bring him to the door or the, or the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear. He shall serve him permanently, this version says. But if you go to the King James Version, let me just take you there. I have lots of Bibles in, my, in here. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Hmm. How long is forever in that case? His life. <clears throat> as long as it's supposed to last. And I won't bother to give you with all the Greek, English, lexicon, and the New Testament, other early Christian literature, da 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 da. And I have one of these at home. It's quite an interesting book, which I used very extensively when I was studying Greek. While these verses suggest that forever does not have to go on for a long time, the righteous can be assured that eternal life will have no end because there will be no more death. And there's Revelation 21.4 and 20.14. The servant mentioned in this verse, Exodus 21.6, clearly could not serve beyond his own death. The word forever, eternal, or everlasting all have similar meanings in the ancient languages and compare Jude 7. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah and the nearby towns whose people act as those angels did and indulge in sexual immorality and perversion. They suffer the punishment of eternal fire as a plain warning to all. How long, is they, how long are they burning? It's eternal, but... Uh, it's eternal. Not has anybody gone, Has anybody gone over there to see Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? Okay, now, let's, now, we've, now that we have seen some of the results of understanding or misunderstanding those first claims of the Garden of Eden, what other implications do we see exist in modern times? What is the meaning of soul or spirit? Let's see if we can solve that one before we run out of time here. Okay. Um, mind again. Yeah. The creation account makes it clear that humans were created by the Lord. Genesis 2 7 describes two of the Creator's intimate actions. The result of those actions was the creation of the first human being, Adam. 
The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and in brackets it says the first action, and, and then in brackets the second action. Breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and the result, uh, the man became a living being. Nefesh Kaya. Genesis 2.7. Ontologi Ontologically. Ontologically speaking, we are a unit. Body plus spirit equals living soul. God created Adam as a living person or a human being, literally, in Hebrew, a living soul. The word soul means in this context, person, being, self. The basis of biblical anthropology is that we are a soul. We are a soul. Yes. Emphasis there. We do not have a soul. Hans Wolf asks, what does Nephi's a soul mean here? in Genesis 2, 7. Certainly not soul, and in brackets in the traditional dualistic sense, Nephesh is designed to be seen together with the whole form of man, and especially with his breath. Moreover, man does not have Nephesh, he is Nephesh, he lives as Nephesh. Okay. As Wolf Anthropology in Old Testament. Okay, we're going to look at several scholars from different theological persuasions and see what they say. I mean, we're going to, some things from the Bible as well. There are clear examples in the Bible in which the word soul refers to an entire person. Gordon? Genesis 46, <clears throat> 15, 22, 25, and 27 to 27. These are the sons that Leah had born to Jacob in Mesopotamia, besides the daughter Di Dinah. In all, his descendants by Leah numbered 33. These, jumping to verse 22, these 14 are the descendants of Jacob by Rachel. Jumping to 25, these seven are the descendants of Jacob by Bilhah, the slave woman whom Laban gave to, her daughter, to his daughter Rachel. The total number of the direct descendants of Jacob who went to Egypt was 66, not including his son's wives. Two sons were born to Joseph in Egypt, bringing to 70 the total number of Jacob's family who went there. Good News Bible. Okay. And so now look at the more traditional King James. At the tradition, this, the end of that in King James. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his sons, besides Jacob's out of, sons. No, wives, not sons. Out of his, out of his loins. loins. Okay. Besides the, uh, Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls were three score and six. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten from King James. Okay, so what's a soul? It's a person. Okay, look at another King James version. August 2, uh, Acts 2, 41, not August 2. Then <clears throat> they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. What does that mean? 3,000 people, right? Yep. Okay. Myra? Bible study guide uh, for, what well, doesn't say. Okay. Thus everything we are and do must be sanctified by God. Within our existences, existence as humans, we experience life on a physical, emotional, mental, intellectual, spiritual, and social level. One cannot separate these aspects. For example, when we engage in physical exercise, whether we jog or work in the garden or walk, we, engage, we also engage our feelings, our thoughts, and our mental, spiritual, in the event that we pray or recite a biblical text, and social faculties. If we were not alone, if we are not alone, during that time of our activity. Okay, so we all know very well, all of us at our age, I'm sure, that it's possible to do several things all at the same time. I run every morning, sometimes for an hour or more, and while I'm doing that, I'm listening to the Bible or something from Mel and White mostly, and I listen to that and get great spiritual benefit. So I'm, my mind is working like that, and at the same time, my feet are going. 
many significant theologians from different backgrounds have supported this, this idea. We're going to run through these fairly quickly. Ezekiel makes it plain that soul is immortal when he states the one Hebrew, Hebrew nephesh, uh, who sins is the one who dies. A soul, or that is a person who does not live according to the will of the God, will perish. It means that a soul or a human being can sin and die. And die. Jesus confirmed it. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And I'm going to drop down. Uh, Jim, can you read Claude Tresmontant? Claude Tresmontant correctly asserts, by applying to the Hebrew nephesh, that is soul, the characteristics of the Platonic psyche, soul, we yet, excuse me, we let the real meaning of nephesh escape us, and furthermore, we are left with un, excuse me, innumerable pseudo problems. Claude yeah. Testament. So you just can't do that, he says, okay? Yeah. One of the clearest examples of death being a kind of sleep is the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. Uh, with the amount of time we have left, I'm sure that you're familiar with that story in John 11. Let's drop down here. Plato, roughly speaking, a contemporary of Malachi, the last Old Testament prophet, enhanced his Hellenistic teaching, making the belief of the immortal human soul so prevalent that it became a popular view. During the intertestamental period, the teaching of eternal torture and the practice of praying to the dead, etc., etc., and there's all the verses. Tertullian, a Christian apologist, who one of the uh, first among Christians who claimed that humans have an immortal soul. I may use, therefore, the opinion of a Plato when he declares every soul is immortal. So Tertullian, even though he's a Christian, clearly says he's quoting from who? Plato. The Greek Plato. Plato. Oscar Coleman challenges Tertullian's view and stands in opposition to it. Coleman wrote a very influential book and so forth. Another one, Brevard Childs. It go, we could go on and on. There are hundreds of these scholars from other places that says, if you go back to the original biblical findings, if you look at the words as the words they are and so forth, it's very clear that soul means a person. You take a body, you add to it the life breath, it becomes a what? A person or a soul. Since only God has immortality, it should be clear that for us to live forever, we must depend on his gift of eternal life. He, God, alone is immortal. He lives in the light that no one can approach. No one has ever done that, and so forth. And we'll have to come, come to a conclusion at that point. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for being with us through this discussion. And the very interesting aspects of uh, the teachings of the Bible and the teachings of others in conflict with the Bible. Help us not to make the mistake of accepting the teachings of Satan is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.